First, do we have any bill introductions this morning? All right, seeing none. Um, you all should have received through email the minutes for the March 2nd and March 3rd meetings for appropriations. Were there any changes to those minutes? So if there's not any changes, uh, the motion by Representative Helgerson uh, to approve the minutes, seconded by Representative Estes. All those in favor of approving the minutes say aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, the minutes are approved. Um, actually, uh, I'm going to call on Representative Estes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it didn't get noticed, uh, but my phone went off yesterday. So for the next time we get together, what is the committee's pleasure for breakfast? <laughs> Steak and eggs, is that right? <laughs> hey, I got my husband's credit card. We'll roll. <laughs> All right. Thank you for knowing that. I did not know that your phone went off yesterday, so thank you for letting us know. All right, committee, we're going to go ahead and move on to a bill hearing uh, this morning, um, and we're going to have the bill hearings and work a couple of bills, and then we're going to move into uh, resuming the discussion on the budget. Uh, so first, we're going to have Shirley Morrow with the Kansas Legislative Research Department uh, give us a briefing on House Bill 2626, which is regarding the Teacher Service Scholarship Program. Shirley? Good morning, Mr. Chair and Committee. This is House Bill 2626, and this is a service-based aid scholarship through the Board of Regents, and it was established in 1990. It provides financial assistance to students who plan to teach in a discipline or an underserved geographic area where there is a critical shortage of teachers as determined by the State Board of Education. Up to 80% of the scholarships are typically awarded to students majoring in special education. Recipients of the award must teach in a hard to fill discipline or underserved geographic area for up to one year. And uh, for each year they receive the scholarship or they have to repay the scholarship with interest. Students must be Kansas residents and priority is given to upper class students followed by high school students who demonstrate high achievement in the ACT with a good GPA and class rank. The average award of the scholarship annually is $4,000. The current appropriation for the scholarship is $1,547,000 and that serves approximately 386 students. What this bill would do is double that amount so that would serve approximately 773 students and it goes out to the year uh, 2027. Now one thing I will note is in 2021, the board has the ability to move money from scholarship to scholarship if there's underused scholarships and overused scholarships, they can move money. In 2021, there was 300,000 additional dollars put into the teacher scholarship. This scholarship has uh, received a lot of activity over the last couple of years. Uh, so they have been adding more money to the scholarship. And this bill would take effect with publication in the statute. And I'd be happy to stand for questions. All right, thank you, Shirley. Uh, committee, are there any questions for Shirley? Representative Carlin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Shirley, is there, uh, how much is the scholarship or is that determined on? Uh, the average annual award is $4,000. Okay, okay, thank you. And um, is this, um, uh, possibly, can, can students participate in something like AmeriCorps along with this or? That I don't know. Okay, all right, thank you, Mr. Chair, thank you. Any further questions for Shirley? All right, seeing none, thank, thank you, you for the bill brief. Uh, we'll go ahead and move on to testimony in regards to House Bill 2626 and the first individual that I have as a proponent uh, in regards to House Bill 2626 is Representative Poskin. Welcome to committee. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, committee, and happy St. Patrick's Day. I'm Representative Mary Lynn Poskin, House District 20. And before coming to the legislature, I worked in higher education for 20 years and own a small business where I do college admissions advising. My husband and I, he's here with me today, have a blended family of seven children who spent a total of 90 years in K-12 classrooms, 62 of which were here in Kansas schools. So I'm a bit passionate about teachers and scholarships. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to testify before you in support of House Bill 2626. As the revisor uh, told us, this bill doubles the appropriations to the Kansas Teacher Service Scholarship from approximately $1.5 million to $3 million, sunsetting in five years. So the ask is for an additional $1.5 million each year. I'm hoping to make you all mini experts in and mega enthusiasts of this scholarship program today. Um, recipients of this scholarship agree to teach in an accredited Kansas school one year for every year they receive the scholarship. Data from the Kansas Board of Regents shows we are only able to fund half of the eligible recipients annually, therefore the call to double the appropriations. So I'd like to walk you through our portion of the packets at your desk. And the first thing that you'll see is a cover sheet. And the cover sheet is signed by all 36 bipartisan co-sponsors of the bill from every corner of the state. The rest of our packet contains the data that moved them to support the bill. So I don't think it's news to anybody that a teacher shortage crisis looms large for our beloved Kansas as outlined in the news article, which is the next piece of your packet. A coalition of education organizations are working on a comprehensive strategy to address the issue. Um, you'll notice that Dr. Brett Church is um, uh, quoted in the article, and I believe that we're going to hear from him today as well. Um, doubling the power of the Kansas Teacher Service Scholarship will quickly double the pipeline of teachers committed to teaching in the Sunflower State. The legislature has wisely invested $10 million a year in initiative, engineering initiatives for our colleges. So what will we do without enough math and science teachers to prepare our children to succeed in engineering curriculum? Uh, this year in financial institutions and rural development, we've done fantastic work on initiatives to draw families and businesses to our rural communities. You know what else they're going to need? More teachers. The next item in your packet is the 2021 Kansas Board of Regents Financial Assistance Report. And if you'll open it to page two, we've highlighted the uh, amount of scholarships uh, that are awarded versus the amount of people who are eligible. And we've only awarded about half of that, 349 out of 729 eligible applicants in 18 and 19, 466 out of 832 in the 19 and 20 um, academic year. This teacher shortage is not just happening in Kansas. Think of this, the recipients of this scholarship agree to teach in Kansas. The ones we don't award can be scouted and recruited away from the state. So what exactly is the Kansas Teacher Service Scholarship? The next item in your packet is the Kansas Board of Regents um, two page, and I'm mostly gonna talk about each area that's highlighted there. Um, recipients who get a credential in a hard to fill discipline such as math and science, special education, early um, elementary education, can teach anywhere in the state of Kansas to meet their service, service obligation agreement. Teachers obtaining any other credential can meet their obligation by teaching in an underserved area, which is defined as Wichita's USD 259, Topeka's USD 501, KCK's USD 500, and the entirety of the State Board of Education Area 5, which is pretty much the western one-third of the state. There are a couple of important things that I'd like to point out about the scholarship. Uh, the first thing is that it prioritizes juniors and seniors. This is important because they've already demonstrated their commitment to be being a teacher, and it's not like we're setting something up that's going to take four or five years to get a return and have more teachers. If we award seniors the scholarship, they will be out in a year and committed to teaching in the state of Kansas. It complements the work we did on the Promise Scholarship Act where potentially students could start two years at the community college and then transfer into a teacher education program at a Kansas college. Uh, 
I'd also like to point out uh, when the question was how much is the scholarship, Representative Carlin, um, that is dependent on the enrollment status of the students. And what is really important about this is that there's flexibility in this. You often think of college scholarships going to a freshman, you know, and they do this for four years. Um, but this is available for students who are part-time, full-time, three-quarters time. They can also be online students. Um, and that leads me to a question that one of the co-sponsors posed to me uh, before he agreed to sign on. And that was, what about the paras who are teaching in my district now? Um, they are often very familiar with the schools. They love the schools and they want to become teachers. So they can indeed continue to teach or be a para full-time in the school district and pursue their teaching credentials online. So that was an important um, piece to one of the co-sponsors. I'd also like to point out that all the systems are in place. We're not creating something new. We don't need new rules and regs. They're already processing this many applications. They just need to hit the yes button on sending the money and that you've been um, accepted to the scholarship. So the next piece in your packet is a listing of where the 466 teachers are currently teaching and fulfilling their service obligation across the state. And this is a really good time to shout out to my um, office assistant, Becca, because in your own packet, the students who are teaching in your districts are highlighted. So these are individual to each of you. You like what you see? this bill could double that number. And if you don't think you have enough students teaching in your district, we can, you can take this information back to your district to increase that. Um, we'll be hearing from several proponents of the bill and there are additional written proponents whose testimony I sure hope you will consider. Um, I did want to highlight part of Jean Clifford's testimony who represents the State Board of Education Area 5, which is one of the underserved areas. Um, she says that the Teacher Service Scholarship Program has brought State Board of Education District 5 alone 67 desperately needed teachers in a variety of areas. These teachers are serving in 24 of the 84 school districts in the State Board of Education Area 5, and they're making a significant difference in the ability of lo local districts to fill teaching positions. This allows local districts to keep class sizes lower and ensure students have the best opportunities to learn. But many more teachers are still needed, and there are more applicants who need the scholarship to ensure they have the financial ability to complete their programs. This program greatly helps applicants finish their program and step into those unfulfilled positions in local districts in Kansas. I urge your support of House Bill 2626 and will stand for questions. All right. Thank you, Representative. C committee, are there any questions for the representative? Representative Humphreys. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much for being here. It's great packet, lots of good information. Um, so I didn't hear, I know you said it depends on the type of student as far as the amount of the scholarships. Is there a range there is on, on the Kansas board, this piece on mm -hmm. the back, it says that if a student um, recipients are eligible for up to $5,830 per academic year, okay. and then it is prorated depending on their enrollment status. So um, for nine to 11 hours, so the 5830 per year is about 2915 per semester. So if you're not enrolled full time and it's three quarters time, you drop down to 2335 per semester. If you're half time, it drops down to seventeen forty nine per semester, and if you're in three to five hours, it's eleven sixty six. And that's interesting. Uh, if I may, real quickly, Mr. Chairman, that in our committee when we had them this amazing presentation, they were saying it's harder for students um, with a handicap to go full time, and and but also scholarship opportunities are less. So I'm confirming. You said part time students can. Get Absolutely. the scholarship if they're involved in teacher education. Absolutely. And that can be private or public schools? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Both thank for the college credits and the schools that they teach in. So they can earn their credentials at a private school and they can also teach in a private school. Okay, thank you. Thank you if Mr. it's accredited. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Representative Alcala. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative, thank you. Good presentation. Mm -hmm. Probably not against this. My question for you is, do you know the diversity breakdown of the teachers in Kansas right now? I, was... I don't. That would be a great question for research. Okay. And, and I think this is related. If it's not, Mr. Chair, you can stop me. We have a diversity breakdown of our committee, and it's important because this way 
people can say things that other people may not be aware of or culturally may not know. But I've been making this statement whenever the issue comes up that the State Board of Regents reflects very little of the reflection of the citizens of Kansas. We have nine elected officials on the State Board of Regents, one African American, one Asian American, no Latino American. There was a spot that came up several months ago. I contacted the governor. And because, it, and whether we like it or not, there's a big influx of Latinos in the state of Kansas. And the only way we're going to address these issues and educate these kids, if someone knows the culture or is from the culture, I could be married to Sydney Carlin and she could be Sydney Alcala and they put her on the State Board of Regents. That doesn't count. So I bring this up because there's no diversity that reflects the total amount of students that are within the state of Kansas in the public school system. And so I'm real unhappy with that. I, I support this, but I want to make that clear because if I don't say it or someone doesn't say it, it goes unnoticed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. May I answer? Yes, Representative. Uh, thank you very much for those comments, uh, Representative Alcala. One of the things I think that is really important about this teacher service scholarship is that it does pave the way for all students uh, to uh, get these teaching credentials. And in some of those communities, uh, the financial aspect of uh, the four-year college and the teaching credential can be a barrier. And this could be a pathway to open those barriers so that we can fill our teaching positions with more diversified candidates, and then they can become regents after they've served for a while. Representative Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So with licensures going up, they have gone up about 200 new teacher licensures in the past five years. And the number of college students, at least in our region schools, staying relatively the same in five years. Why are teachers leaving the profession? Because more people are getting licensed, so there has to be another reason. So could you, or do you have an opinion on that? So I don't have the research on that, but the um, Dr. Brett Church has done a significant survey around that, and I believe he's testifying today as well, maybe not to that point exactly, but he can provide you extra research on what he has found about why teachers are leaving. Okay, thank you. I know that just in conversations, it's behavioral issues. Teachers are really stressed out over behavioral issues. Thank you. I, this could address that, um, as Dr. C or Jean Clifford said. Um, we can keep class sizes smaller as we, if we have enough teachers, and that might help address behavioral issues in the classroom. Representative Sutton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative, I'm not picking on you. I had the same question with regards to an engineering program that we have going on <laughs> in the state. And I'm not even sure how to track this data, but I'd be very interested in finding out how many of the teachers that are taking advantage of the scholarship and teaching in Kansas were planning on doing exactly the same thing, whether they received the scholarship or not. And I know that that's difficult to track. I mean, we, maybe we send out a poll or something and, and the, even then the results could be questionable uh, because of, of uh, other motivations but uh, like the hopes of renewing that scholarship, for example. Um, so I'm always hesitant about a program that takes credit for achieving something that it might not actually be achieving. And so do, do you have any information, even anecdotal on that, that, would, that could shed some light on whether or not this is truly keeping Kansas teachers in Kansas or just paying people who were planning on teaching in Kansas to begin with. I don't know that that is data that the Kansas Board of Regents uh, keeps track of. Uh, so, you know, that would be historical information. But what I can tell you is that moving forward, math and science teachers in particular are going to be in such high demand that they will be recruited and are currently being recruited to teach out of state. What this does is keep them in state. So they are committed for every year that they get the scholarship to teach in the state of Kansas. So it gives us leverage against the recruiters from out of state to take our Kansans and our teachers elsewhere. And I think that's only going to increase as the teacher shortage um, continues to deepen. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Ballard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This program is is different, but very similar to the program that we offer for medical students in Kansas. And part of it is if you teach 
if you for every year you you have to go to a rural area that's part of the preceptorship which is now over 60 years in existence um, in Kansas and part of that is they get familiar with the areas they are but the bigger problem is many may want to go in that area but not financially have the money to do it and the difference is this program then provides the financial incentive and it will reach the student where they are. If they can only go a fourth of the time or half or three quarters, they have the assistance that they're able to do that. Mm -hmm. My problem, my concern, I guess, would be what we do all the time. How do you get the word out that this financial aid is available? For medical students, when they apply, they know they're looking for money because it, it's so costly. But how would you do this to be able to answer whether you want more people of color? Do you want more students that have disabilities? How would we get the word out that it is available? Because I'll tell you, it's almost like this thing. If you build it, they'll come. And if you offer it, you will get those students that you really need to be there. Well, um, this bill doesn't address that and doesn't have any appropriations for money like that. Personally, I'd be willing to travel the whole state during out of session time uh, to promote this because I'm so excited about what it does. But to answer that, what I'm hoping is that's part of the reason why each one of your packets has the teachers highlighted that are teaching in your districts because I think this is something that every representative would want to bring back and publicize in their district so that they can say this is how it's working now and we're going to try to double that. Um, I will tell you that um, the academic advisors at our colleges who offer um, teacher education and credentialing programs uh, are always looking for more money and ways to help their students stay in, in school. And so I'm hoping that through the eligible colleges and universities, there will be some communication in that regard. And even though the scholarship focuses on juniors and seniors, uh, my background you know, shows that uh, the high school counselors are always looking for this kind of information. So we could um, potentially, when this bill passes, be take responsibility for that as representatives and then try to uh, make sure that those other avenues know about it as well. Well, I thank you for your presentation. I mean, I can tell you, I would be very supportive of it because I see a lot of these students and I speak to high school seniors a lot. I have a summer program where they come from all over the state for our youth program at the Dole Institute of Politics. And they ask similar questions. I want to go to college, but where do I find the money? Or in this case, you're saying for teaching, this is available, and yet they have a responsibility to give back in the process. So, Absolutely, it's win-win. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any further questions for the representative? All right, seeing none, thank you for being here and thank you, your Committee. testimony on House Bill 2626. Uh, we'll go ahead and move on to the uh, next conferee that we have this morning, and that is, uh, I think the representative had mentioned, uh, Professor Brett Church with Emporia State University, and he'll be joining us by WebEx. Mr. Church. Thank you. Um, good morning. My name is Brett Church, and I am a school leadership professor at Emporia State University. I appreciate the opportunity this morning to speak to you regarding teacher recruitment and retention in Kansas as it related, is related to House Bill 2626. Uh, we have a growing educator shortage, uh, having a significant impact in schools and communities throughout the United States. Two-thirds of school districts nationally report experiencing teacher shortages, and teacher preparation enrollment was down one-third from 2010 to 2017. This challenge is affecting our state as well. Teacher vacancies increased 62% between the fall of 2020 and 2021. And preliminary statistics show that total completers in universities throughout the state and all licensure areas related to pre-K through 12 education could be down over 200 completers when comparing 2021-22 and 2022-23. In response to this growing concern, the Kansas Teacher Retention Initiative was launched in the summer of 2021 through a partnership between Emporia State University, the Kansas Association of School Boards, the Kansas National Education Association, and the United School Administrators of Kansas. All each of these organizations have been individually aware of this growing challenge 
This collaboration established an alignment of efforts and a clear and focus, clear and shared focus, representing key stakeholder groups that working together can address ways to meet this challenge head on. As a first step in the process, the Kansas Teacher Retention Survey was distributed between October and December of 2021. The response was excellent with over 20,000 educators participating in the survey, representing approximately 50% of educators in Kansas. The data was analyzed and in early 2022, a state report was released. Educators who participated in the survey were asked to rate their likelihood of retiring in the next three years, changing districts, going into administration, and leaving the profession entirely. The Likert scale utilized for the questions were not likely at all, potentially but not likely, somewhat likely, more likely than not, and very likely and will probably happen. 14% of respondents answered that they were more likely than not or very likely and will probably happen to retire in the next three years. 16% of respondents answered that they were more likely than not or very likely and will probably happen to leave the profession at some point prior to retirement. This does not include those who are retired. We combine these two factors to identify what we call an overall risk factor of 30%. This percentage represents the number of educators that Kansas schools will have to replace simply to keep the number of teachers at current levels. The alternative for some districts will be less teachers and higher class sizes. Additionally, we asked educators to rate their satisfaction on 34 factors related to their job. One of these questions asked about tuition reimbursement or similar incentives to advance your education. The response to this question placed it as 31 out of 34 factors. Due to the challenges we face with encouraging and recruiting those into the education profession and retaining those educators once they are in our schools and communities, any assistance is meaningful in helping to incentivize those who want to secure an education degree, teachers returning to get a high need credential, or assisting someone currently working in a classified role like a para in our schools to get their teaching license. This funding would be important to reversing the current trend. Furthermore, based on the number of applicants for the Kansas Teacher Service Scholarships that are currently unable to receive assistance, House Bill 2626 could provide relief in a very timely manner. The coalition supporting the Kansas Teacher Retention Initiative is committed to continuing our work in the future. We hope to continue to administer the Kansas Teacher Retention Survey on a biannual basis. And we look forward to continuing to work with Kansas educators, Kansas school districts, and Kansas community members for the benefit of Kansas students. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Church. Uh, any questions for Mr. Church? All right. Seeing none, thank you again for being here um, you, by virtually. Um, committee, I'm showing that there is written testimony from Representative Stephen Howe, Blake Flanders, Lauren Miller, Matt Lindsay, Dina Horst, and Ben Jones, and Jerry Hinn. Um, all proponent testimony. So if there's anybody that wishes to uh, report to the committee in regards to a proponent for House Bill 2026, here's your chance. I'm not showing any opponent or neutral testimony in regards to House Bill 2626. So if there's anybody that wishes to address the committee in regards to opponent or neutral testimony, here is your chance to do so. All right, seeing none, we'll go ahead and close the hearing on House Bill 2626. All right, committee, we're going to go ahead and move on to a discussion item that we had yesterday um, in regards to Senate Bill 443, and that was in regards to paying off some of the bonds that was passed by the Senate. And so to give us a bill brief on Senate Bill 443, I'm going to ask Stephen Wu to give us a briefing on that Senate bill. Stephen? Good morning, committee. Um, Senate Bill 443 is the payoff for the two, the early payoff for the two bonds within the Department of Administration's budget. Um, those two bonds total, uh, the payment would appropriate $332 million from the State General Fund to the Department of Administration to pay off two bonds early. Those two bonds are Series 2015A, which is a bundle of refinance bonds, some debt service for the dredging of the John Redmond Reservoir, and some debt service for the KU Medical Center Education Building. Um, it also contains payment, the early payoff of bonds for debt related to the National Bio and Agro Defense Facility, NBAF. Um, these payments would uh, pay off the debt service principal in 23, as well as the remaining balance for both of these bonds. Um, would note that this uh, Senate Bill 443 passed the Senate floor 40 to 0, and would be happy to answer any questions on these. All right. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, committee, are there any questions for Stephen in regards to Senate Bill 443? Seeing none, you did a very thorough job, so there's no questions. Thank you. 
All right, committee, I am not actually showing anybody as a proponent, opponent, or neutral testimony in regards to Senate Bill 443. So if there's anybody that wishes to address the committee, here's your chance. And if there is nobody that wants to do that, then we are going to close the hearing on Senate Bill 443. All right, committee, we're going to go ahead and move on to final action on House Bill 2716. And this is concerning the authorization of educational benefits for spouses and dependents of deceased, injured, or disabled public safety officers and employees and certain deceased, injured, or disabled military personnel and prisoners of war. And then the definitions that were changed, increasing the limitation of reimbursements to the Kansas educational institutions. So do we have a motion in regards to House Bill 2716? Representative Estes. I move that we uh, forward the bill favorably. All right, committee for the motion is seconded by Representative Hoffman. Any discussion on House Bill 2716? Seeing none, Representative Estes, you may close your motion. Uh, I appreciate the committee supporting this bill last year. I heard from a lot of folks who were uh, excited that this could help them and their families, particularly um, some folks who put themselves on the front line and have suffered losses recently. And so I close my motion and ask you to please support this bill. All right, committee, hear the motion. All those in favor of passing out House Bill 2716 favorably for passage, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion, motion passes. All right. Thank you, Representative Estes. We'll go ahead and move on to final action on House Bill 2492, which is submitting claims against the state by the Joint Committee on Special Claims Against the State. And I believe we do have a balloon amendment. Um, and that is going to be passed out. And if Jill, if you could explain the balloon amendment. And I guess for formality, if we could have a motion to go ahead and approve House Bill 2492 favorably for passage, and then we'll have a discussion on the amendment. Representative Helgerson. All right, you've heard the motion by Representative Helgerson, second by Representative Hoffman. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Discussion? Jill. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, before you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, is a balloon. We had just spelled one of the claimant's name incorrectly. And then in regard to the Office of the Secretary of State claims that we were paying, we had not actually put the correct appropriation in. So that's just a revising drafter issue that we needed to state it in the way it is out in the balloon. And then on uh, lines 29 and 30, we just had the correct, uh, excuse me, the incorrect account and fund name. So I'd be pleased to stand for questions if there are any. Are there any questions for the revisor's office? All right, seeing none, thank you, Jill. Uh, do we have a motion to approve the balloon amendment that the revisor's office just pre presented with us? Representative Humphreys. Thank you, I move that we accept the amendment uh, by Jill, that Jill just explained. All right, you've heard the motion, seconded by Representative Helgerson. Uh, any discussion on the balloon amendment? Seeing none, Representative Humphreys, you may close. I close. All right, you've heard the motion. All those in favor of the balloon amendment say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Any further discussion in regards to House Bill 2492? All right, seeing none, Representative Helgerson. I had a point. I can't, I can't find my notes. There was, there was one person who had eyeglasses that they did not fund the full amount. And I, I, I can't, I don't have it in front of me or how much it is. It was like 200 bucks or something. And it seems like we're taking the responsibility and we're cutting the cost of the replacement eyeglasses because they were depreciated. No, I don't. And I'd make a motion to put it back to the full amount, whatever it is. And I, if somebody has the figures, I, that just seemed to... Are you making a formal motion? I'll make a formal motion. All right, committee, you've heard a motion seconded by Representative Carlin. Discussion on the motion, Representative Humphreys. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just want to explain a little bit about that situation. That person has eyeglasses issued by the Department of Corrections. They have the proper eyeglasses. They get visual examinations. They've got glasses. 
The, these were in addition, these were personal glasses that were sent to them. They were actually above the amount that they're supposed to have personal property. And so they were, something happened to them and we agreed some, whatever happened shouldn't have happened, but they have glasses. Those glasses were above the amount. And so that's why the committee voted and chose to just do half of the amount instead of the full, or half, or the depreciated amount. So we're not keeping somebody from ha having the proper eyeglasses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Helgerson. I, well, I'll do it on my clothes. Uh, how's that? Representative Ballard. Thank you. I, I do want to thank you for bringing that up, because that, that didn't, I wasn't comfortable with that. And I happened to mention it to several people, and they went like, wow. If you lose something of value to you and somebody just decides, say, because it depreciated, it's, it's not worth that much. Well, that's a personal opinion about that. Um, and maybe if it was something else, I think there was, there was another one there with the chain that was holding a cross. And we decided that the the chain was too expensive for the cross to be on it. You know, that's a that's that's a little bit I don't know. But anyway, I, I agree with the eyeglasses because you know you may have another pair, but this pair was still your glasses and in moving it someone was careless. That's where I'll stop. Thank you. Any further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, Representative Helgerson, you may close. This is the smallest motion I'll ever make, I'll tell you. <laughs> but we've accepted the responsibility. Uh, I just don't think, we, and, and, and for everyone, the original request was for 296.93. He had a receipt for 189.93. The committee gave 138.45. I am making a motion that we move it back up to the 296.93. You know, I just think that's what it probably costs. I'm being corrected. 189, I think. Is, that's the amount that he had the receipt for. Yeah, that's the amount he had the receipt for. But if you're trying to replace the glasses after we took the responsibility of misplacing them, breaking them, or whatever, I would make the motion that we go back to the 296.93. Closing a motion. Closing the motion. All right, committee, you've heard the motion. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? No. The no's appear to have it. The no's do have it. Motion fails. We're back on the bill as amended for House Bill 2492. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Representative Helgerson, do you want to close on your initial motion? <laughs> Representative Helgerson. I will, I will reluctantly close on this and look at an opportunity of dealing with it later. So having the bill 2492 passed favorably as amended. Favorably as amended. All right. Or not uh, as much. <laughs> committee, you heard the motion. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. All right, committee, we're going to go ahead and resume discussion uh, this morning in regards to House Bill 2588. As you recall, yesterday we had the contents of 2592 moved into House Bill 2588, which is the appropriations bill from the House and our position. So any further discussion in regards to House Bill 2588? Representative Francis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I've got a couple of items here, but the first one I'd like to... Uh, bring up is on the Board of Indigent Defense Services budget, um, there was an item in there that the governor recommended and our committee also concurred with to uh, set the maximum uh, compensation or to fund the maximum compensation rate of assigned counsel at $120 uh, for fiscal year 2023. We've been told by staff that they don't think that the language allows them the ability to actually implement that increase. So, um, 
My motion is to add language to the Board of Indigent Defense Services to set the maximum compensation rate for assigned counsel at $120 per hour for fiscal year 2023. And I'll just be real honest, I don't understand the, the intricacies of why this has to be done that way, but that's what I was told. Okay, do we have a second? Second by Representative Owens. Um, Representative, so this isn't changing money, it's just changing the language. That's okay. right, correct. Any discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, you may close. I, I close. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries. You have another one? I do, uh, Mr. Chairman. So I think as many of you know that uh, many of my budgets were uh, uh, had a large number of salary progression plans that were a portion of those. You know, it's very important for me that, that those uh, plans be implemented because I believe in the work that those, those agencies did. Um, and if you go to your, uh, to your green sheet, I don't know exactly the way I need to proceed on this as far as motions, but the top two items are uh, KBI uh, enhancement plans that uh, were brought to us that we supported. A variation of those is included in the governor's budget amendment, but we're not at that point yet. Um, also, when we go down, um, we have uh, the Kansas Highway Patrol that the governor excluded from the budget. We've got the Board of Indigence uh, Services uh, pay plan adjustment. We've got the Kansas Sentencing uh, Commission's adjustment plan, Department of Corrections uh, system. Um, those are all things that I, uh, I believe in and support. So I do probably need some help how I work through this. Um, with that, Dylan, do you have the, I've got a uh, salary adjustment proposal to make sure that these enhancement plans get through, which is the, uh, what my committee requests. Uh, but I do think it, we need to uh, tweak uh, the governor's request some as a result of that. Um, and if staff will hand those out, just so everybody can kind of follow along. It's kind of involved. Just to preface some of this, is this is being handed out. I, uh, while I respect the. Uh, uh, the need for salary across or salary increases for all of our employees. I uh, think that many of those necessary salary increases have been included in these enhancement plans that we've passed, um, and, and that's what's kind of driving this. But as I've mentioned always, uh, I feel like the state needs to take a more systemic approach to uh, how we handle salary increases. I think that's one of the things that's that's difficult for our employees is they don't know what to expect from government. And I think our employees are our most important asset. You know, I just saw um, the other day they were, well, this morning as I was watching CNBC News, they were talking about Costco employees. Costco is one of the most uh, profitable uh, retail operations in America. They're also one of the most high paid and they have good benefits for their employees. And, and one of the reasons they attribute to their, their success is the lack of turnover. Uh, it saves costs for training. Uh, so the first item on this salary adjustment proposal is to request a joint interim committee to study the state employee pay system. Um, I, I often talk about an under market study or a market study. The state already prepares one of those on a third of the employees a year. I think we need to be more involved in that as part of the legislature. But this interim committee would look at the, that market study for hopefully the last two years, and then the one that they'll be working on uh, this year. Uh, it would evaluate the state unemployment system as it relates to the use of classified and unclassified service. I think we all know the problems we have uh, trying to be fair to both our classified employees and our unclassified employees, and that, that creates problems across the board. But I do understand that we have a contractual obligation to the classified employees. Um, we would look at compliance with existing Kansas statutes regarding state employees. 
uh, evaluate other state employment systems for comparison to Kansas, evaluate options to tie compensation to performance reviews, and then other duties as determined by the chair related state employees and state employment system. Again, the purpose of this is to try to take a broad systemic look at our compensation system, see what we can do uh, to better retain and uh, attract new employees to the state. Um, and just to be clear, we would, uh, we're going to request this, so it's going to be a letter to the appropriate person, whether it be the uh, House leadership or the LCC. Um, let's skip over part two. That's really not, it's kind of a result of the rest of the things. So um, in, in item three, um, just as the governor has in uh, her budget, uh, unclassified employees, agencies would appropriate an amount necessary to provide a 5% salary adjustment for unclassified, and unclassified employees as a merit pool. That's the language that's in her uh, budget right now. And I think that's probably wise. We hire our, um, our uh, supervisors in government to make these decisions and, and they can uh, then uh, reward uh, or increase uh, uh, salaries as necessary. The second part is a little bit different. Um, in the governor's proposal, um, her request is to increase the entire pay system for the classified employees by 5%. In lieu of that, this talks about two steps on the salary matrix and provide the director of uh, personnel services the authority to add two steps to the salary matrix to accommodate those adjustments. So what happens is we've got this big grid and we do have some employees that have worked for the state for a number of years and they're maxed out on the grid. So that's why we need to add the two steps. Uh, this also allows, rather than lifting up the entire pay system, this allows us to still give a 5% raised to a number of employees that have already received uh, large increases this year. Uh, the next part is the employees that would be excluded from the 5% salary adjustment. And the attempt on this is to mirror what the uh, governor excluded, but also to mirror those employees that have received very large increases this year as we've addressed uh, these things in our uh, enhancement program. So. Um, we would uh, exclude employees who are hourly employee recipients of the 24-7 pay plan. I think we all know that there's a number of, of uh, increases for those employees uh, that are uh, classified as temporary. Uh, you know, we're going to have to address that or else they're never going to be temporary. But as long as those temporary uh, uh, increases are in effect, uh, you know, there's 30, 40 percent increases in uh, compensation for many of those employees. Uh, we would exclude legislators, elected officials. As in the governor's uh, uh, budget, uh, we would exclude Kansas Highway Patrol troopers included in the career progression plan. Um, you know, as my um, committee delved into that progression pay plan, there's three um, uh, aspects to that. The one is the progression plan that we've finally uh, got a copy of. Another is $250,000 to um, uh, bring the uh, Capitol Police parity with the other uh, highway patrol troopers. And then a third portion of that was a 2.5% cost of living uh, uh, COLA increase that is out there for them to uh, make adjustments as they uh, do their negotiations with the troopers. Uh, teachers at the School of Blind and Deaf, they're tied to the Olathe school system salaries. Employees and judges of the judicial branch because of the pay progression plan that we uh, enacted last year. My committee, in addition to the governor's budget, had uh, the uh, salary enhancements for the uh, uh, agents and the forensic scientists. Uh, the sentencing commission had uh, a pay improvement plan uh, if you'll notice at the end, uh, we put in the wording, uh, who received market adjustments. Uh, some of those employees didn't receive very, uh, didn't receive adjustments or not very large. State fire marshal uh, employees uh, who received market adjustments. Board of Indigent Services uh, included in the uh, salary enhancements. I'm not familiar with the uh, specifics of the Office of Administrative Hearings, but in conversations with staff, uh, that's another one of those budgets. And then kind of a catch-all at the all, we've got any other 
employees on a career progression plan. I think many of you that have been around for a number of years know that when we try to uh, get into the details of this, sometimes uh, things happen that we didn't intend to happen. So as part of this, we've also allocated uh, 2.5 million SGF and 500,000 in other funds uh, to be uh, given to the uh, State Finance Council um, to, um, says, add language to provide the State Finance Council authority to utilize any remaining funds after salary adjustments described below to address salary inequities elsewhere identified by the Director of Personnel Services. So again, I, ju I just want everybody to know my intent is not that people don't get their 5%. It's just to kind of try to uh, um, work some of the details out. Um, the results of this would be a, a reduction of uh, 15.9 million, including 15.3 million SGF from the governor's recommendation. And uh, with that, I'd stand for questions. I do formally make a motion in regards to your I would make a motion for that lengthy uh, diatribe of mine, yeah. All right, committee for the motion, seconded by Representative Carpenter. Discussion on the motion. Representative Humphreys. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you tell me um, if that 5%, if teachers are included in that overall state 5% and they're not excluded on your list? Representative Francis. Are you talking about higher ed or K through 12? Well, I'd like to know both, if separately. K through 12 is handled through uh, the local school boards. Okay. I think we're trying to, there wasn't an attempt to exclude whatever was in the governor's budget as far as higher ed, but we're checking on that real okay. quick. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Wolfmore. What's that? I'm going to wait until he. Board of Regents teachers are in it and it's distributed as a pool for them to allocate. Okay. Representative Wolfmore. Thank you. This is a lot here, so I have several questions. First of all, the 5% would go into effect. You're not postponing that waiting for the interim study or anything. That's no. going into effect now. Right. Okay. So, but you're excluding the ones who, we had kind of a list of people who we thought should get brought up to market um, and we're way behind. So some of those are in here to go to market and then they would not get the 5%. Is that correct? That's right. And, and those are pretty well itemized on the green sheet. Uh, KBI, uh, Highway Patrol. Um, oh, I need someone kind of be a lifeline for me on the government ethics. I see them That's right. as on this uh, finalization report. Uh, BIDS, uh, Kansas Sentencing Commission, Department of Corrections. Well, Department of Corrections, the, the people that were brought to market as part of the 24-7 are excluded. So, yeah. So did you, I was going to ask specifically about governmental ethics because I know they were in dire need. So they are part of coming up to market? Well, I, I need a little help from the chairman of that budget committee on what needs to happen there. I've had some conflicting uh, information. Representative Sutton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the governmental ethics is, is going to be already covered under the 5% and I don't see him excluding those on this list. Um, I think there may be uh, legitimately a, a role for increasing the pay of the secretary himself, uh, which would currently be receiving a 5%. We may be looking at that again in the future, but, but uh, I don't see it being excluded here. So I'd be comfortable with the 5% being added to the governmental ethics uh, overall. Like I said, future conversation on the director's salary as well. Representative Wolfmore? I think. Uh, and just to Francis. add on to that, so, so if they're not excluded down below, they would get the 5% to a merit pool to be divided per the governor's uh, original budget. And then um, child protective service specialists were one of the most dire needs we had because of the work they do. And I think they were a part requested the market base to bring them up to where they need to be. Um, is that not in your list of bringing up to market? Because I think that would be a better deal for them than the 5%, and it's such a dire need. So they're not deleted. 
they they weren't deleted in the original budget. So I, I don't remember what happened. Who's got that budget um, on the child protection? I say research. Do we have any uh, insight on what happened in regards to committee? The, the child. So my understanding is whoever that budget chair is, is, is that you, Representative Carpenter? Representative Carpenter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I believe it is, but I don't have any information on that. So the, under my proposal, well, I guess that, that be all at the end, if they were part of a career progression plan as we passed it in the budget, they would be excluded from the 5%, but they would still get their career progression plan that we passed out of the budget. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. That's why I just wanted to make sure of that. Um, but then, um, and then my, my last point, I am concerned the employees and judges of the judicial branch. And I do know that they, we had a pay progression plan, but the reason we did the pay progression plan because they were so hopelessly behind. And then when we leave them out of the 5%, I think we're undoing a lot of the good work that we've done. So. I um, would be very concerned about leaving them out. Representative Francis. You know, I, I share your concern. And this is a very difficult um, thing as we walk through this. And I think it's just awful difficult as we start to say, well, your pay progression plan is good and this pay progression plan is bad. But I, I think that's why I feel like that interim committee is so important is so that let's get through this budget year let's let's get a group of representatives and senators together so that we all have have a buy in and we're rolling in the same direction and then let's try to find uh, i'll tell you representative as i talked to members of the administration and some people that have been around here a long time a number of years ago the state had it appears you know hindsight's always 2020 we don't know for a fact but they reviewed under market positions on a three-year basis throughout the state. And the, my understanding is the legislature for a number of years funded those positions that were under market. You know, I feel like right now, and I'm not trying to say the judges are that way, but, but right now it's kind of who the squeaky wheel gets the grease around here. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so again, I, I guess that's my concern is if we start exempting people all the way through here, um, you know, we're opening the door for another group. Representative Sutton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, this is a lot of work. I'm, I'm, I applaud you for, for taking the initiative to go through this. Um, I share similar concerns, however, and actually I'm going to add one other group. Uh, Regarding the judicial branch, I, I, I share the previous concerns on that, along with the Office of Administrative Hearings. Uh, in both of those cases, uh, we're trying to get people up to market. We've been rather negligent in the past, for good reason or bad, uh, but we've been negligent in the past, and we, and we really need to make that up. And so setting them... It, we start progressing them toward market value and then we stop regular pay raises. We're just, we're just moving backwards. And, uh, and so I would uh, be far more comfortable excluding the judicial branch and the administrative hearings from section four here. Is Thank that a substitute chair. motion? That is a substitute motion. All right, seconded by Rep Representative Wolfmore. Uh, discussion on the substitute motion. Representative Wolfmore. So just to be clear, you said excluded, but they would be eligible for the 5% is Taking what you're saying. Off of this. Yeah. Thank you very much. Any further discussion? Representative Humphreys. Taking off the judicial branch, was there um, just just the judicial branch? So Administrative hearings. Okay. And, and so that's taking off F on this list here for F. Yes, F and, and K. And K. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any further discussion in regards to the substitute? Representative Landwehr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I didn't look in on the budget side, but were they exempted in our budget? Or were they Sutton. included in the pay raise? 
they were included in the initial budget, yes. Okay, so this doesn't exempt them from getting the current pay raise today. It just has them to be studied, or is it actually ex it removing that from the current budget? This, this, the way this is or the phrased. Next fiscal says, year, I'm sorry, Representative. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Next fiscal year, not the current fiscal budget. Uh, that's an excellent, Mr. Chairman, that, that's an excellent question. What's presented here looks to me like. Uh, it doesn't really say what year we're talking about. It just it says, says 2023. Excluded from the 5% the, uh, salary adjustment. I want to make sure that that's not the case. So, so my that's understanding of the way this was drafted is whatever pay progression plan they have currently in effect, do you remember how much were they supposed to get this year in the one that we passed last year that's in their budget? For sudden. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, for the judicial branch, it was 5%. Um, administrative hearings, I can't recall off the top of my head. So they would still get that 5% that right. was in your budget. So when you put them back into this, when you exclude them from that, then they would get a 10% increase this year because of this motion. That is correct. Yeah. That's my intent. And again, I, I, I'm honestly opposed to this. I mean, this is kind of a slippery slope because every one of these organizations is going to have a great reason why they need to be uh, included in the 5% and not excluded from it. So I'd be opposed to it, but uh, I understand what we're trying to do. Representative Landwehr, did you have follow-up? I guess, Mr. I guess what I'm trying to understand is if they were slated, all of these on this exempt list, and I'm not saying it's a bad list, if they were slated in the budget we've been working on to already get a pay raise, why couldn't we do that? Go ahead and give whatever pay raise was slotted, form the interim, and then have that discussion next year to see what this committee brings back to us. I mean, I just think that, you know, they've been following this process. They've been looking at this process. I just don't know that we would want to, if there's any pay raises for these people to be in the next fiscal year, that we remove that. I'm not inclined so, to support Well, and I would, I would say right now we're on a substitute motion in regards to excluding the judicial branch and administrative hearings. Well, That's exclusion. more of a question for the amendment in general. Banning the ban. Representative Landwehr? And that was Representative Sutton? Right. Do you understand what my, my question is, is rather than just let's go through here and pick and choose who we do and who we don't, if they are slotted for a pay raise, all these people, A to L, if they're slotted in the current, or not current, but the next fiscal year budget we're working on, let's give them that raise, appoint the interim committee, then we come back in 23 and see what that committee presents to us. Um, so would you be willing to just make it that they all go back in to whatever they were going to get and then form the committee? Representative your substitute? I'm, Mr. Chairman, I'm not very clear on, on what's being recommended here. Uh, our committee already looked at pay comparisons the agencies have done, many of the agencies, maybe not all, the two that I'm talking about have already done pay comparisons. That's what they're going to find when the interim committee studies it. They're going to retrace the path that our committee took. <coughs> and what we found is that these people are well below market value, well below. Uh, our attempt at getting them up to market value shouldn't preclude getting the uh, uh, the regular pay raise that's that is being uh that's currently on the table we're trying to catch up and so catching up by slowing down is probably not an, a real strong strategy representative carpenter did you have a question several but um <laughs> Are we on the motion right now? We're on a substitute motion. Okay. Well, um, I think it's a, a slippery slope, like the chairman said. 
that we start down this picking and choosing. I, I think simply, and, and this is for the chairman, all these folks that are A through L received raises this year. Is that correct? In 2023? Again, always... we're on the substitute motion talking about the judicial branch and administrative hearings. So let's, if this fails, we go back on the original amendment talking about all the individuals that are listed A through okay. L. So Sorry. right now we're on a substitute motion specifically talking about the judicial branch and administrative hearings. Sorry, Mr. Chairman. Representative Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My question is somewhat similar to Representative Carpenter's in clarifying that A through L is all there to say which ones do we dare to pick out as this particular amendment does. If indeed there is some form, as the uh, Chair of Transportation uh, had, had, had alluded, that there is an increase in those, each of the other areas also have that issue. So as I start trying to pick which one of those that have an increase need to meet it, I have concern about that. So thank you. Representative Humphreys. Representative Landwehr. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. So a little clarification that I now have with staff okay. is it's my understanding that they are getting a pay increase. Correct. This... 5% would be on top of that pay increase. So they would get two pay increases. Now, how much of an, an inequity are we creating without studying? Reverend Sutton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's, that's my point. We're not creating an inequity. We're, we're trying to ke make up for lost time. Uh, we are well behind on their pay schedule and have been for some time. Uh, we're trying to get them up to market level. And in order to do so, uh, as I mentioned, slowing down that process uh, is not a good strategy for catching up to the, the market on this. And I understand that, and I don't. I, under, I understand that, and don't necessarily disagree. I just think if we allow this interim committee to study the pay and we come back with a comprehensive plan versus us, let's do this, let's do that, oh, let's exempt this because we can get the votes for that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We let the, the judges have their pay increase that they're going to get next year. There's already one built in. Right. I don't know what that percentage is. I bet staff can tell me it's pretty It's 5%. Quick. On top, so this would be five on top of five. Right. So that's a 10% pay increase. That is correct. And that's my intent. Okay, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'd have to op oppose this. I think that if these individuals on this exempt, and I know we're on your sub right now, is to get, give them a 10%, you want to create havoc in this state, that's exactly what this amendment here would do. So I would ask that you oppose this amendment. Let's stick with the original plan. It's not because we don't want to give them a pay increase. And, you know, and I've got a, a lot of judge friends and I know the judicial branch is sitting in here, and I consider him a friend as well. But no one makes you be a judge. No one says you have to be a judge. If you're wanting to make a whole lot more money, go into private practice and charge by the hour. But I say this is the first time in a long time that, that and I appreciate what Representative has brought to us, as a comprehensive study on what we are doing going forward. And if you build one set of a 10% pay increase, you're going to get a call from a whole lot of other people. We don't know what our fiscal position is going to be. And this is one of the reasons, having been a legislator that has served in this body, as has Representative Helgerson and Representative Ballard, when there was more money than we knew what to do with. If we didn't cut it with taxes, we spent it. And everyone has to keep in mind the majority of this money sitting in our pot right now is one-time money. And you're going to I know you're tired of hearing me say this, but I'm going to keep repeating it until people understand. If we have to come in later, two years, three years, when the recession hits and cut the current fiscal year budget, it is difficult and it's not fun. The current, not, our, not the next fiscal, but the current, we're setting ourselves up for failure. And that's also not fair to the employees that we're also responsible for. So that's why I would say that we move forward with the original plan, 
the judges are still going to get a 5% pay increase, and that's fine. They just don't get a 10% pay increase. So we're not reducing them. We're not saying they're not going to get anything, but they'll get five instead of 10. So that's why I would oppose your motion. So when you reference the original plan, do you mean the amendment that was brought forth by Representative Francis mm -hmm. or yes, the I'm governor's sorry. request? <coughs> Representative Francis. Okay. I just want to make a clarification. Thank you. Representative Carpenter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my question is to the maker of the motion. So when you did your budget process, did you expect that they were also going to get the 10 per, the 5% employee instead of recommending a 10% raise? You thought that you gave them a 5% raise and then you were thinking they were going to get the pay plan also? That is, Mr. Chairman, that, that is correct. Uh, we, we didn't imagine that someone would be cut out of the of a universal uh, pay increase. And so we, yes, we baked that in, uh, in the, in the discussion. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Representative Owens. I'm going to withdraw my question. I'll hold it until after the amendment. All right. Representative Wolfmore. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm going to continue to support, um, representative Sutton's motion. In the, in the private marketplace, you go anywhere, when you get a market increase, it's because they've studied it and they've figured out that they're so below that it's not where they need to be to keep those employees or to have those judges leave those private practices and do this very important work. So whenever you get a market increase, you're not then denied the, the regular increase that employees across the board get because that put you further behind. So we are undoing, I believe, our work. I understand the issues, but I think we're undoing the, the great work we've done the last two years to finally get the judicial branch up to where they need to be. And we have got to do something to start attracting people out of private practice, those really good attorneys, to serve as judges. It affects us all. So I support the motion. Thank you very much. Any further discussion in regards to the substitute motion? Seeing none, Representative Sutton, you may close. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my in intent on this, uh, really the focus isn't so much on the judges themselves, uh, but what we're also talking about are all of the employees of the judicial branch. That's where we have a real crisis. Um, yes, there's a crisis in judges. There's a crisis in, there's a crisis in everything. But trying to keep people staffed in the courthouses is a real, real challenge. And, and that's what we're trying to make up for. Now, I'll have to admit, for many, many years that I've been here, I was one of them cutting the judicial branch budget. Or not, or, or maybe not cutting, not increasing. How about that? Keeping it level. We've kind of got to make up for that a little bit. We've fallen behind. And there may be others on this list that are in exactly the same boat. I didn't review their budgets. I did review these. And I saw the market comparisons. And I understand where we are as far as the funding of their salaries is concerned. And that's really what we're talking about on both of these branches is salaries. So, uh, so with that, I, I stand by the fact that this, the uh, uh, extra increase is absolutely appropriate to dig us out of the hole that we've created. And I will move my motion. All right, committee, you've heard the motion. All those in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed? No. The chair is in doubt. Uh, all those in favor, raise your right hand. Uh, right hand. Okay. Or left, if you want to. <laughs> I don't care. Opposed, same sign. Motion fails on a vote from 9 to 12. We're back on the original amendment. Representative Owens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This, is, uh, <coughs> this has been incredibly uh, informative and enlightening. I spoke with Chairman Francis yesterday about this and really have come to understand what we're doing here is, in my mind, 
and maybe it's not as simple as I'm making it, these 5% salary adjustments are to make up for the 7.5% inflation that we're experiencing currently. Regardless of whatever pay anybody else has been promised in any other budget along the way, this additional 5% is trying to adjust for a 7.5% inflation, which means, for example, um, and I go back to the troopers, everybody knows I, I love my law enforcement guys, they got a 2.5% increase last year from the governor. With this 5%, they're going to be even to where they were last year. Just even when we take into consideration inflation. So, Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we eliminate um, number four in its entirety because I believe that if we do not adjust for inflation with the employees in this state and take that into consideration, you're right, it is a choice to be a judge. It is a choice to be a trooper. It is a choice for everybody to, to go anywhere. But that means we're losing them as state employees and the cities and the counties that are making those inflation adjustments and are increasing wages then take our good employees that we need to rely on. All right. The substitute motion. Correct. Representative Owens. Correct. Yes. To substitute remove. motion. My apology. Which would be to strike um, number, number four. four in its entirety. All right. Second by Representative uh, Sutton. Discussion on the motion. So I guess the first question that I have is, since one of the exclusions was legislators, well, yeah, we'll be apologies. giving ourselves a 5% pay increase. I didn't know that we were even part of the governor's 5%. Were we part of the 5%? No, we were not. We were not. Okay. So that technically shouldn't even be in there. All right. Uh, further discussion on the motion. Representative Tarwater. Representative Landwehr. Can we get from staff, I just haven't pulled it out of mind, is what each one of these here are currently in the budget to get a pay raise for? Each one of the... Uh, in, this, in this number four, what's the, what are they set to receive pay raise wise for the next fiscal year currently in the budget, which has nothing to do with this amendment? So it, it varies greatly, mm -hmm. you know, from position to position. I mean, there, there's honestly hundreds of positions. But, for instance, on the troopers, the uh, – um, I'm trying to find some information so that I'm quoting accurately. And I think they still have to negotiate this with the Troopers Association. Um, But that would be a, an easy one for me to get to if I can find the color-coded one. So the, the trooper trainee uh, under the, uh, law, under the uh, enhancement plan gets 18.6%. Uh, the trooper number one uh, gets 10.3% uh, for zero to three years. They get 7.5% for four to five years. After that, we see quite a, a drop off in that they've got two and a half percent. But um, but in addition, as I mentioned earlier, there is a two and a half percent COLA increase that was misfigured when they figured their budget that's available for their management to give them additional raises as they see fit. So that would be something kind of worked out between them and the Troopers Association as they go. Um, I, I know this is all kind of anecdotal and I don't want to wear, uh, wear um, everybody out, but like for instance, Community Corrections 1, let me try and find that, uh, went from I believe, do I have that here? You get so many dang papers when you look at all these budgets. But uh, Okay, let's move on. Representative Landwehr, did you have a follow-up question? Yes, and I, and I appreciate the efforts of staff, and it would take us some considerable time to figure out what each one of these were. But just looking at some of the bigger ones, the pay increase down here in the bottom is slated for over $60 million currently. 
So we're asking to do that plus another 5% on top of it. Right? I believe you're correct, yes. Well, it's, it's, or it, this is beyond upon, the governor's recommendation. Right, whether it was 5%, 2%, 25 because, and, and that's what uh, staff was, was showing us, is how it varies depending upon what the agency came in, and that's what would be difficult for them to, they can poll it, but it'll take them a while to do it, and I don't think we have that kind of time, is I say that we stay on with where uh, Representative Francis is at with this so that we can study, because they're still going to get a pay increase for next fiscal year. So do, or is it really the intent of the legislature to say they're going to get a pay increase and a pay increase? Yes. Yes. So if it's two and a half, it's 5%. If it's 5%, it's 10%. Is that the, is that the kind of pay increases that we want to give? And these are agency requests. These are not really dissected down to a science as to what they mean. Are they legit? Are they what's actually needed? They're guesses. Wishless. Reps of Francis. And I wouldn't want to characterize them necessarily as a wish list, but some of the things that we see in here, for instance, is earlier in the year, we received some information as far as like corrections officers. There's an 80% turnover in corrections officers, so I don't want to minimize the need here. But as a result of the uh, governor's uh, uh, attempt to address that issue with the 24-7 pay plan, um, after um, their base pay increase uh, that was made permanent, they make eighteen twenty six an hour. With the temporary increases, if you're at a, uh, um, a critical staffing facility, you went from eighteen twenty six to uh, twenty four seventy. So I mean, almost a thirty five percent increase. And then after. Or excuse me, you go to 2470 after three months. You go to 2426 just with the increase. Then you go to 2516 after nine months because of temporary pay increases. I think we exacerbate the problem when we add another 5% on top of that. And just to give you some other information, I believe the Community Corrections 1B is the higher level corrections <coughs> officer versus the 1A. And uh, market rate on that, I don't believe market rate is accurate on this. It's only... 1722 as of uh, one as of uh, uh, 122. So, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder on some of these. I can go through my budgets and I can find people that got 50% increases, 80% increases. Uh, that's the 80% was probably an exaggeration, but I can go find the 50% increases for you pretty easily in other budgets. And again, that's where. I mean, if that's what the committee wants to do, I mean, I think we do it. But, but this saves $15 million this year, saves $15 million next year, saves $15 million the year after. I mean, this thing kind of compounds, and I, again, think we need to do a more systemic approach next year to address this issue. Representative Corbett. Representative Carpenter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I applaud the maker of this whole mess here <laughs> for, for his uh, for the discussion I, I do I, I know it's hard work and and this discussion proves how hard it is to get these kind of things done but I, and I want to bring uh, your attention to a which is uh, the state hospitals are part of the 24/7 plan they've received a huge amount of money, and I think I testified in committee, it was like $24 million in, in increases over the last four or five years. Uh, you know, at some point in time, and I've said this before, we're going to have to realize that money is not the option in those situations, and that that is a fair pay, many of them 25% in, increase in pay. So uh, I think when you start picking and choosing, if I did anything, I would make a substitute motion to pull out a substitute of the substitute motion to pull That's out. That's not in order. <laughs> yeah, there's no such thing. Back I know, up. I know. But I'm just saying, uh, when we start down this, uh, where do we stop and where do we start? And so I'm going to oppose this motion, um, and uh, hopefully the interim committee will take a look at this and address some of these issues. But uh, thank you. Representative Wolfmore. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to clarify, um, um, Rep and Representative Owens, by the way, I support your motion. Um, 
the, in the governor's budget, F through L are already in the governor's budget, so that's not an addition. And we wouldn't do for, a, I assume you don't want elected officials in your motion, legislators right. elected right. officials, right. and we don't control the teachers for the school for the blind or deaf. So that would, that's not something that we have control over. But F through L are already in the governor's budget to get that raised, so we would, that's not adding any additional money for them. And in addition to inflation, I would remind people that health care, so we have given like three raises in the last 12 years. The price of health care has eaten up those raises and more, and that's before we even talk about inflation. So I, I love the idea of the interim committee. I hope that happens as soon as possible. But in the meantime, I would support the motion to not exclude these people from the 5% raise. Thank you. Representative Landwehr. I just think, Mr. You know, Mr. Chairman, and I don't know exactly what our schedule is on advancing our budget out um, today. Is if there is time for us to get maybe some more detailed information as to what this total approximately will be if we leave it in there, and then what what does it mean in the out years would probably be very helpful. I think I support where Representative Francis is coming from. Let's get, let a joint interim, interim committee take and study this, but thank you. Well, and I think we have the dollar figure because it was included in the governor's original recommendation, correct? It's in her budget. The dollar amount, if you leave all these individuals in, was in the governor's original recommendation. So we have the dollar figure affixed to the governor's recommendation. Oh, wow. Representative Johnson. Mr. Chair, I would call the question on the Owens Amendment. All right. The question has been called on the Owens Amendment. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? No. The no's appear to have it. Reviser. The, the, the motion was to call the question on the Owens Amendment. So we're having a vote on the Owens Amendment. So all those in favor of the Owens Amendment say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. The no's appear to have it. Division. Division has been called. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed, same sign. All right, the motion fails on a vote from 9 to 12. We're back on the original motion. Representative Owens. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. I didn't call the question, so I didn't even have a chance to close and, and make my closing arguments, and, and I had that already. Not really. Um, <laughs> <laughs> however... You know, it was actually just brought to my attention that, that apparently the Kansas troopers uh, were already excluded from the 5% increase uh, per, per the governor's budget anyway, so they technically shouldn't even be in here. This is the problem that we're running into, and here's my concern, okay? When I look at, and, and I look specifically at the troopers, um, we're taking our, our experienced troopers, our master troopers, and, and we're giving them a 67 cent raise for the year. Now, yeah, they may have gotten two and a half percent, which is another 67 cents. So we're giving them a dollar 20 an hour raise, uh, 5% to try to make up for seven and a half percent inflation. And then we're also saying here, and I'm using them as an example, this can apply to any agency, that by the way, we're going to give you what you get and you're going to be stuck with it till next year, even if this committee comes back and says technically you should have got 10 or 15 percent. Is there a single person in this room that thinks inflation is going to go down over the next year? Because I certainly don't think so. Which means that all of our employees, their cost of living is going to continue to increase over this year. Studying it is important. Love the idea. I respect the chairman. But our employees, as with my employees and my businesses, are my single most valuable asset. Single most. Before I get a raise, before I invest in equipment, before I look at infrastructure, before I do anything, I take care of my employees. Because without my employees, I am nothing. 
I am nothing without my employees. If we do not apply some of that same logic to our state employees, we lose them to cities, to counties, to other occupations, and then we don't have enough judges to run the courts. We don't have enough law enforcement to, to run the troopers. We don't have the people that we need to run our state agencies. If I knew coming into the session, it was gonna be the single biggest challenge because of what we were seeing in the private sector with wages increasing and with inflation. It's gonna be our biggest challenge. I cannot, I cannot comfortably kick that down the road for another year without some specific uh, addressing uh, of these budgets. And hey, if that means you, you appoint an interim committee to meet in April, I'll, I'll spend two weeks on it so that we have a solution come May. We've got to do something because we cannot expect people to survive another year. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Carpenter. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I understand that it kind of just goes to show you how our system is, but with this 24-7 play plan, um, in 2022, 9.2 million in my budgets and KDAD's budgets and 18 million in 2023. So those folks have already received that raise. And, and to me, uh, putting a 5% raise on top of that is just overkill. So anyway. Representative Francis. Just to respond to some of the comments earlier, every Everybody needs to understand that the uh, trooper pay progression is negotiated with the trooper association. There's two and a half percent worth of money that is not allocated to address the needs that the prior speaker talked about. It's not like if this happens, there is no way forward for them as they proceed in their negotiations. But I think that's part of the problem across government as a whole as we're dealing with this. You know, some people talked about. Uh, Everybody needs a raise. I, I understand that, by the way. The intent of this is not to make sure nobody gets a raise. It's to make sure that we allocate our scarce resources as well as we can for the taxpayers of this state. And when we look at some of the raises that I looked at when I came to this deal, I've got one entity where we've got an employee going from 43,000 to 67,000 dollars which is a 56% pay increase we've got another one going from 23,400 to 35,000 um, i've got an agency that has has shortages all the time and part of their pay progression plan is going from 83,000 to 120,000 these are professional positions we respected the uh, agency as they brought this progression plan forward, but I can't in good faith think that we need to allocate our scarce resources to an uh, employee that's going from 94500 to 140000 a year as a result of some of these enhancement plans. And uh, I just want to point out some of the anecdotal evidence, and I can share it with other individuals as we go forward. Representative Landwehr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And you know, I, agree, I agree with Representative Owens. We do the same thing in our business. Our employees are always first, and if there's not enough money, we don't take a paycheck, but our employees always get theirs. When it comes to law enforcement, I don't know that you'll find anyone bigger supportive of law enforcement. My, I've got so many family that's been in law enforcement, is in law enforcement, and I it, pray every day that they all go home safe because they can pull over for a taillight. Next thing you know, we've got an officer down. If we don't do this responsibly, we're going to be raising taxes within the next two or three years. And it wasn't that many years ago, folks, that $1.2 billion retro tax increase, retro, retroactive tax increase, was done in the legislature. Actions have consequences. And the only way, if you do this, not having a solid plan and knowing what it is that you're going to do, you're going to be doing another tax increase. So now who have you hurt? The very people that you say that you want to protect. And I would like to say that all the employees that of, of our constituents are all getting a cost of living increase. Guess what? They're not. This has to be studied. We can't willy-nilly. But it's not because I'm sitting here and discrediting any of these in, any of these individuals. I have supported raise increases over the years, and I don't have a problem doing that, but there's already a wage increase put in here. This would be on top of 
why double it with not even knowing what those numbers are? We know that this total on here is somewhere around $300 million. Where's that money come from? How many other areas have we spent that money in? And again, remember, the dollars we're dealing with, the majority of that is one-time money. And when we came in as a legislature and cut the current fiscal year budget, we also came in the next legislative session, not only cut the, what was happening in the year after that, we raised taxes. Not with my vote, but we raised taxes. So you have to ask yourself, are you prepared for a tax increase in the next two or three years? And other states are actually cutting taxes. Kansas is not. Representative Wolf Moore. Thank you very much. In any organization I've ever worked for, the metric that they always watch is turnover. Because the way, I believe, the way that you throw money away and you ultimately have to raise taxes is when you continually to churn to your employees and turn them over. That costs you a lot more than a, a small raise for an employee. So I think the metric we need to always look at is turnover. Because if we're turning over a lot of people, we're not paying enough, we're losing them, and that costs us a lot of money. It costs a lot of money to hire an employee, it costs a lot of money to train an employee, and you lose valuable experience when they go out the door. So I think responsible raises on a regular basis keeps our employees and costs the taxpayer actually less money in my mind. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Ballard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, you know, for someone from the outside listening to this conversation, I would imagine they'll say, boy, they must be paying those employees a lot of money because they don't think they need any more. You know, but the truth of the matter is that doesn't always happen. We had eight years there that we did not increase employees' pay. And I didn't hear anybody crying about that in terms of they didn't get enough money. Now this is an opportunity, maybe we could make up for what people did not have or the years that we did not. And just because we've given them 5% and in some cases 2.5%, we'll say, well, that's enough. They should be thankful. This is what it is. This will put us over. We don't know if it'll be sustaining. Well, you know, the average person doesn't understand that. If you look in the paper, not only do you see gas prices are up, but you also see revenue in the state of Kansas is up. And then we wonder why, but we see that every day. We are up. We know we have an April consensus coming up. So, you know, I would say to myself, we're not overpaying any state employee. We're not. But it sounds like, if we listen to it, it is. Let's put them on hold until we can get to that point. Everybody has their own point of view. And I decided I was going to put mine in there now. Because part of it is we're not overpaying any state employee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Corbett. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I know there's not anybody in this room would probably like to be a, high, a highway patrolman. And, uh, you know, I don't know what kind of a raise they're talking about, but. You know, a credit card transaction is about 3 or 4%. <laughs> but I don't know where that's going, but you hate to see everybody going, but it's not just your employees. Everybody in this state's leaving because we're the third or fourth uh, with per capita for state empl government employees. I mean, this whole state is, is heavy. And I don't know where, what we have to do to do about, about it, but uh, if, it's, if it's given a raise to the highway patrolman to keep them, that's one thing. I, I just, uh, I'm more worried, I'm more concerned about the tax policies coming out of this building that nobody can afford to stay in this state, especially retirees. Thanks. Representative Humphreys. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do want to, I think, uh, just say one thing I don't, that hasn't been said yet. And one of the reasons I fully support R Representative Francis in this is because Part of the process of the interim committee is to evaluate options to tie compensation to performance reviews. I don't think there is a responsible business that when they have made salary increases for their employees, they give everyone always a 5% increase. And the state has tended to 
be across the board. I think merit pay increases is something that we should look at. Of course we know inflation is outrageous and people need raises and I agree 100% with that. But I, I also am so happy to agree with my colleague from across Wichita and across the room that we have to do it responsibly and a blanket 5% is maybe not the most responsible way. It may hurt people other people in the long run. And so I am fully in support of this. And part of it is, as, as I mentioned, we hadn't talked about before was that that merit piece of it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Carlin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't know if anybody <clears throat> was on the uh, tour of the prisons that I was on with the Corrections Oversight Committee. I don't think anybody in here was there. I saw a woman guard <clears throat> in a pod with 100 uh, prisoners, one woman, 100 prisoners. And they were so low that that was happening throughout the system, that they just had, they just didn't have enough people to cover. And at Christmas, we didn't have Christmas visits because there weren't enough guards to cover. Now, that could have been corrected. I didn't see a correction, but there was an announcement that there would not be cr visits to, with uh, uh, inmates because there were not enough people to cover the, the project. So, you know, I, I, I think we took care of the prisoners with the 24-7, I mean, with the in guards and corrections with that raise. But that was, that was just to basically keep what we had. And I think that we really look around in a year, if we do this, if we cut this. As I see this, we're taking 15 point... I'm confused. Uh, representative said that we were saving 15.9 million and number two on this blue sheet <clears throat> we're saving 15.9 million by actually we're cutting the pay by that much pay increase by that much and i'm i'm confused about that number two representative francis so the governor's recommendation was five percent for everybody and the attempt of this uh, adjustment proposal is to remove from the governor's proposal those that have received salary marketplace studies already. So we've got a number of employees in these, these groups that are receiving 18, 25, 35% increases, and we're just allocating the 5% to the ones that aren't getting anything at all. And some of the ones that are getting the higher increases, we're removing that. Representative so Carlin. Taking, excuse me. So we are uh, taking $15.9 million out of the governor's pay raise. Yes. Well, I disagree with this um, uh, entire um, motion by Representative Francis. I, I have to agree with Representative Lamweir. <clears throat> let's pay it this year. Let's study it. If someone, one of the comments that Representative and my, somebody's laughing at me. Well, I'm sorry. Representative Francis said somebody went from 27000 to 35000 My gosh, how am I going to live on $27,000? I mean, you know, so I, I think we have to realize what we're saying. The, the individual that goes from 27000 to 35000 still gets that increase under this proposal. Good. Yeah, we're not taking those away. We're not giving them the 5% on top of that. Okay. I, We've got individuals going from 85,000 to 110, 83,000 to 120. They still get that increase. We're just not giving 5% on top of that. Okay. That's what I thought. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Representative Francis. Representative Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We've had a lot of discussion about whether or not employees should get raises or not get raises. Under this proposal by Representative Francis, everybody but us and, and other elected officials are going to get raises this year. All this does is said if you already were going to get a raise, you're not going to get the 5% raise above that. Everybody's getting a raise. Most everybody's getting a 5% raise. And it's kind of interesting to me as we talk through this that, again, we're saying a lot of these down here are the squeaky wheel. And, and so they've gotten raises 
or they're, or they're getting raises because they've been the squeaky wheel. There's a lot of employees that haven't been the squeaky wheel that haven't gotten anything. They're going to get the 5%, but if we don't adopt this, we're going to say, well, those that were squeaky wheel, they're getting theirs, plus they're getting another 5 Sorry, those that aren't the squeaky wheel, you're only getting five. So I really think we need to adopt this. I, I appreciate uh, Representative Francis for bringing this, but everybody is getting a pay increase except for us. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Estes. The previous speaker said, answered the question I was going to ask and, and made the points that I was going to ask. And um, I do agree that there's a lot of saints out there who are working for not a lot of money and doing very heroic work. But I, and that is bad for morale. But I think it's also bad for morale when somebody who is not making much sees somebody else who's making more also get a raise. It feels like a slap in the face. So we could be in a, in a lose-lose situation no matter what we do. And I think the answer is we do this study and take a, a rationed and reasoned approach and take the time to, that, to make sure that we're being respectful and fair to everybody. Any further discussion? Representative Burroughs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was hoping that the Vice Chair wasn't pointing me out when it comes to the raise. Uh, I appreciate the discussion. You know, what excites me is when we start talking about the value we put into our state employees. Uh, they deserve to be uh, discussed in, in times of budget discussions. I would just state, Mr. Chairman, for those of us that have been here a while, there was the old Hayes study, and I brought this up a while back. There, I, I'm looking and listening to the optics, and, and our colleague made mention about if they were listening, what would the message be that they would be receiving in this discussion? My concern also is what do our state employees think? Because we're, we're thinking that we're going to get an interim. It'll have to be approved first to determine if we get the interim. And I would hope that they would grant that interim, uh, Mr. Chair, just, just to ensure that this topic does get brought up and they have a chance to work through it. But I want to go back to the Hayes study that was commissioned that, that we as a legislative body paid for years ago. And we didn't fulfill those obligations after we paid for that study. And so if I was listening, I'd say, here they go again. They want to study it to death, and we, we know what's going to come, or we know even better what's not going to come. So I'm just, to my colleagues, I just want to say that I'm excited to see us talk about our employees and the value we put in them, but it's another thing to express and show them the concern we have by at least bringing their wages and salaries up to market rate so that we have the long-term commitment that we've committed that they've committed to us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Representative Francis, you may close. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I just want our employees to know I think they're the most important asset that we have in the state. Uh, everybody is going to get a raise as a result of that. You know, just to reemphasize, we've got three point million as part of this to be allocated to the State Finance Council to take care of any things that arise as a result of this that might be misconstrued as the legislation was, uh, was written uh, and, and somehow they got left out. Uh, I value our employees. I, uh, I think that as we go forward, though, we also have a responsibility uh, in the budgetary process to make sure that our resources are allocated as efficiently as possible. And I think this proposal goes uh, a ways towards accomplishing that. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. I close. All right, committee, you've heard the motion. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed? No. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Motion passes. All right, committee, we're nearing um, 10 minutes to 11 o'clock. Um, and so in in regards to getting in the midst of another discussion and then having to recess, uh, we're going to go ahead and hold off discussion. So please, uh, I guess what we will do is we'll come back after the adjournment of the House and we'll come back into committee to uh, try to finalize uh, items on the budget. Um, so before we do that, I do have a request by Representative Johnson in regards to a bill introduction.
Representative Johnson. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to request RS-2403, establishing the Kansas Sunset Commission. All right, committee, you've heard the bill introduction. All those in favor say aye. Or is there a second? Sorry, is there a second? Second by Representative Helgerson. All those in favor of the bill introduction say aye. aye. Opposed? All right, mo motion passes. Bill is introduced. Okay, so it was just expressed to me that actually redistricting is meeting at noon. Um, so what we will do is I will make an announcement right now. I have conferred with uh, the chairman of the Commerce and Economic Development um, Committee. They should be done by 2 p.m. Is that correct? Yeah. And so we will reconvene at 2 p.m. Uh, in this room, 112 North. We're in recess. Thank you.